Good morning. Wow, it was so lovely. Um, Today my message title is, Accept One Another. Accept One Another. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the love of Jesus that is so deep and wide, embracing us, loving us, forgiving us, leading and guiding us. Lord, we come to you to listen to you, to have fellowship with you. Please speak to us and give us your word in our hearts. Clothe me with grace to share this message. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The key verse is chapter 15, verse 7. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. Let's read this verse together, please. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. Today's passage deals with conflicts that arise in the Christian community over matters of conscience. When such conflicts arise, it is so easy to judge others and to hold them in contempt. But we should always remember how God had mercy on us. And in view of God's mercy, Paul urges us to love one another. In Paul's time, Jewish and Gentile Christians shared fellowship together in the house churches in Rome. Each group's faith was shaped by their cultural context. And as long as this was the case, Conflict was inevitable. These conflicts were not over essential of the Christian faith, but secondary issues. Nevertheless, it is not easy to overcome such conflicts because they are deeply rooted in our cultural values. Unless these issues are resolved properly, it is hard for the church to be united. So Paul dealt with this matter very seriously. Like the Roman church, we also experience conflicts over secondary issues, such as cultural differences, views on baptism, worship attire, music, leadership styles, even character differences. They may seem to be small matters, but they can hinder the unity of the church. So we need to take them seriously and learn how to accept one another. Do you want to accept one another? Then let's listen to Paul's teaching and learn how we can do so. He gives us three principles in this passage. First, for the Lord. Second, for the sake of others. And third, glorify God by following the example of Christ. First, for the Lord. What is first? For the Lord. Yes. First one says, Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. Paul refers to those of weak faith. They are not weak-willed or lacking self-control, but weak in faith, weak in conscience, weak in the practice of faith. To be sure, every genuine Christian shares a common faith, We believe in the triune God, God the Father, 
God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We believe in Jesus, the Son of God. Though he is the creator God, he came into this world in human flesh. He became our Savior. He suffered and died for our sins. He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God. And he will come again as the judge of the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Church Universal, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We all believe this. However, though all Christians share common faith, some are shallow in understanding. Some are weak in practice. Not all faith levels are the same. This is why Paul says some of them are weak in faith. Who were the weak in the Roman church? Probably Jewish Christians who continued to observe the dietary restrictions and special days found in the Old Testament. Verse 2 says, One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. Does this mean that vegetarians are all weak and meat eaters are all strong? No. <laughs> Here, Paul is talking about a matter of conscience. Even though the Mosaic law did not forbid eating meat, many Jews living in pagan cultures refrained from doing so. They feared that their consciences would be contaminated by eating food sacrificed to idols. On the other hand, strong Christians understood that the gospel sets them free from any such restriction. They enjoyed any kind of food, pork, squid, rattlesnake, mmm, tasty. <laughs> Believing that nothing outside a person can make them unclean by coming in. They enjoyed freedom that comes from the gospel. However, we cannot say that all Jewish Christians were weak and all Gentile Christians were strong. Some of the strong were Jewish Christians, like Paul. Being weak or strong was not the issue. The issue was how they treated each other. Paul says in verse 3, The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not, and the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. It is so easy for the strong to show contempt for the weak, thinking that they don't know the secret of the gospel. And the weak easily judge the strong, thinking those guys eat everything at random like barbarians. These underlying attitudes can damage others, even if they are not verbalized. Paul strongly urges that we must not show contempt or judge based on these disputable matters. Rather, we should accept one another. Accept one another. Please turn to your neighbor and say, accept me. Okay, now say, I accept you. Wow, it's wonderful. The message is finished. Yeah, we must accept one another, whether our faith is weak or strong, because God has accepted each person. Paul asks, who are you to judge someone else's servant? 
We have no right to judge. God alone is the judge of each person, and God is able to make the weak stand. God can make them stand. If we judge others, we oppose God, who who has accepted them and is standing them. In verses 5 through 9, Paul gives another reason why we must accept one another. It is because all genuine Christians have the same life purpose and motive. It is to live for the Lord and honor the Lord. Verse 5 says, One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Here, sacred day probably refers to Jewish ceremonial days as well as the Sabbath. Some people observe sacred days as an important part of practicing their faith, and they judged and condemned those who did not do so. Paul says, each person should have their own conviction. The special days in the Old Testament all looked forward to the coming of the Messiah. They were fulfilled by Jesus Christ. So we no longer need to follow these practices. But some people continue to do so in honor of the Lord. We should respect them. In our time, some people criticize celebrating Jesus' birth at Christmas time, saying it is a compromise with pagan culture. But when our motive is to worship and honor Jesus, God accepts it. In verses 6 through 8, the phrases, to the Lord, or for the Lord, are repeated six times. It means that whatever we do, our motive and purpose is to honor the Lord and give thanks to God. Instead of insisting on one's own opinion about disputable matters, we should consider the motive. If it is for the Lord, we should accept it and respect it. If praise music is for the Lord, we should respect it. If hymn singing is for the Lord, we should respect it. If an orchestra performance is for the Lord, we should respect it. If a dance is for the Lord, we should respect it. I one time was in Sudan where they dance a lot during their worship service and had a really good opportunity to appreciate their dance. Uh, They said, Shepherd, you're a little stiff. (laughs) But you got better as the worship service went on. Verses 7 through 9 explain what our life purpose is and how we came to have it. In the past, our life purpose was to gain honor and glory for ourselves. Whatever we did was for a selfish motive. Even giving to charity was for human recognition or a tax break. We were the owner of our lives. But when we accepted that Christ died for our sins and rose again from the dead. He became our Lord and Savior. Our life purpose and motive was changed from myself to Christ. Now we live for Christ and die for Christ. Amen. It's a little bit weak. (laughs) Don't be afraid to die for Christ. Now We live for Christ and die for Christ. Wow, amen. Christ is our Lord. Everything is for him. We belong to him. And when we experience this reality with other believers, we find the deep basis for accepting one another. 
One of my close staff coworkers is a recently retired missionary. Though our cultural backgrounds are quite different, we have worked together very closely in one heart and mind. It is because we share the deep life purpose to glorify Christ and serve his people. I am sure that as relationships go beyond merely cultural and find their root in our common life purpose, we accept one another deeply from our hearts. In verses 10 through 12, Paul gives a further reason why we should not judge or show contempt toward our brothers and sisters. It is because we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. God is the creator and the sovereign ruler. He is the beginning and the end. Just as there was a beginning in history, there will be an end. And God is the final judge. Every knee will bow before God. Every tongue will acknowledge God. The emphasis is on every. God judges each person individually, not as a group, not as a church, individually. And we will each give an account to God for the things that we have done. So we should spend our energy living for the Lord instead of judging others. Second, for the sake of others, chapter 14, 13b through 23. Just as loving God is followed by loving others throughout the Bible, so in this passage, living for the Lord is followed by living for the sake of others. Verse 13b says, Make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. What shall we make up our mind to do? Not put any stumbling block in another person's way. Make up your mind. Decide. Determine. I will not do that. Here, stumbling block or obstacle refers to things that lead people to fall into sin. Paul himself had struggled hard not to hinder the faith of others. He was convinced and fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. Though he had this conviction, he was measured in how he lived by it. He knew that some people still regarded certain things as unclean. And if in the sight of weak people he ate meat, according to his conviction, they would feel pressured and their consciences would be distressed. Here, distressed means grieved or hurt. It is a serious offense that can lead to the destruction of others. And this offends Christ, who died for that soul. And when others observe the result, they speak evil about our good convictions. So Paul refrained from eating meat or drinking wine or doing anything else that would cause a brother or sister to stumble. Though we are free, we should consider how our actions affect others. The use of our freedom should be constrained by the love of God. Martin Luther said this, A Christian is free from all men, yet at the same time is a slave to all. Paul confessed, To the weak I became weak. To win the weak, I have become all things to all people, 
so that by all possible means I might save some. The standard of Christian life is not oneself. It is for the Lord and for the sake of others. We should be able to give up our rights and privileges for others. It's an act of love. Love never disregards the conscience of the weak. Love never dishonors the weak. Love never seeks its own good above the weak. Verse 17 says that believers should be right with God, have peace with others, and be full of joy through the Holy Spirit. Righteousness, peace, and joy are essential to Christian fellowship. And anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and a good influence to others. Paul concludes this section with summary statements for practical application. Verses 19 to 20a say, Let us, therefore, make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. Building up a trusting, loving Christian community takes labor, sacrifice, patience, and time. It requires constant and steady commitment to edify others. We must restrict our own freedom in order to build up and love others. But though we give up our freedom for the sake of others, it does not mean to live without our convictions. Paul tells us, keep your conviction. Keep it between yourself and God. Don't try to make others follow that conviction. Keep it before yourself and God. Have conviction, but keep it between yourself and God. Paul tells us, blessed. Do you want to be blessed? Yes. yes. Blessed is the one who does what is right in the sight of God, who acts by faith without any doubt. Everything that does not come from faith is sin. In living for others, we should always live by faith. Third, glorify God by following the example of Christ. In this section, Paul exhorts Christians with strong faith to follow Jesus' example in dealing with those of weak faith. Follow whose example? Jesus' example. He tells us why it is so important and how we can do so. Verse 1 says, We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Are you strong? Are you weak? Are you average? <laughs> Generally, in any Christian community, the strong provide leadership and influence the weak. The primary responsibility of a loving, healthy community rests on the strong. And Paul includes himself among the strong. What should the strong do? Bear with the failings of the weak. Notice that failings is plural. It's not just once or twice. It's again and again. To bear is to continue to uphold and lift them up until they become strong. A Christian community is opposite of survival of the fittest. In the world, the strong take advantage of the weak. 
But in the Christian community, the strong bear with the failings of the weak. This is the obligation of the strong. I ask again, are you the strong? Do you know whether you're strong or weak? The strong should not please themselves. The strong must please others for the glory of God and the blessing of the community. They should invest themselves in the spiritual welfare of the weak. This is a challenging teaching. Nobody's saying amen to this now. (laughs) So how can we do so? Paul reminds us of the example of Christ. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. Even though Jesus is the Son of God, he did not exercise his authority to make others serve him. Rather, he served others. He was despised and rejected by people in order to bear our failings. While Jesus was hanging from the cross, Dying for our sin. All the people around him hurled insults at Jesus. And Jesus received all the insults with no retaliation. As we serve others, we easily expect recognition and honor. But instead we are often insulted and humiliated, then we can become discouraged and feel like giving up. In that moment, we need to look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Jesus bears with the failings of the weak. Jesus is strong enough to bear all the failings of the weak. And in him, we find strength to bear others as well. We also need to hold on to God's word. Now Paul prayed, May the God who gives endurance, the God who gives endurance and encouragement, give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, the mind of Christ. May God give you the mind of Christ so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul knew it was not easy for the Roman believers to practice his teaching, but he prayed that they would receive the mind of Christ He believed God could give them the mind of Christ. And then they would have endurance and encouragement to press on and serve others in Jesus. After exhorting the strong, Paul now addresses all believers. Let's read verse 7 all together, please. Accept one another then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. What should we do with one another? Accept one another. What does it mean to accept one another? It means to first of all recognize that person is in Christ, just as I am. It is to understand them to listen to them, to forgive them if need be, to serve them, to be one with them. Acceptance is not just sitting reluctantly next to each other in a room. 
It's active. It's intentional. It reaches out and doesn't just sit down waiting for the other person to do something. Accept is not, this verb is not a one-time verb. The meaning is, it's ongoing. Keep on accepting one another. Don't stop accepting one another. In order to glorify God, we should accept one another. How can we do so? Oh, really struggle hard. With all my will, I'll struggle hard. Good luck with that. The words, just as Christ accepted you, point us back to Christ. Christ accepted us unconditionally. While we were still sinners, in the depth of our sin and shame, Christ accepted us while we were enemies of God, hardening our little hearts, rising up against his sovereignty. Christ died for us. We should always remember what Christ has done for us. This empowers us to accept others. Without Christ, our hearts are like the eye of a needle. But with Christ, our hearts open wide like the vast Pacific Ocean. As we come to Jesus, he understands us. He empathizes with us. He welcomes us as we are. He forgives all our sins, clothes us with his righteousness, and fills us with his spirit. Since he accepts us in this way, we can also accept others. Amen. As Jesus has had mercy on us, we should have mercy on others. As Jesus understands us, we should understand others. As Jesus forgives us unconditionally, we should forgive others unconditionally. Amen. Here I thank God for the work of Christ, who has helped me to grow in accepting others. I grew up in the Cold War era, long time ago. As a boy, I was trained by uh, my school in civil defense drills to be protected from Russian nuclear attacks. So I was really scared. And I thought of Russians as those people are going to get us someday. When I was asked to share a message at the 1992 Russia Summer Bible Conference, I accepted, but then began to have nightmares. Oh no! When I prayed, God took away my fear and gave me the heart of Christ for Russian people. I could deliver the message with the love of God, and many responded well. And since then, I have loved and served Russian brothers and sisters in the grace of Christ. Recently, I've had the privilege of sharing spiritual fellowship with Shepherd Alexei Belik through Hebrews Bible study. I never imagined such a thing would happen. It has been an amazing blessing to share the love of God and the sufferings of Christ together with him. I have come to realize he is a great man of God, God's appointed servant to lead Moscow UBF, and a dear, dear brother in Christ. I love you, my dear brother. 
Thank God for helping me to learn the heart of Christ even a little bit. And this encourages me to keep on struggling to accept others. I have many more battles to fight, many more people to embrace, but God gives me courage, encouragement, and endurance to persevere in doing so. May God bless each of you in the same way. After pointing to Jesus as the model, Paul tells how Christ unites Jews and Gentiles into one and why he does so. Jesus became a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth. It was to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs. And since Jesus was still at work to fulfill these promises, the Jews had great hope. And this should inspire the Gentiles to respect them. Moreover, through Jesus, the Gentiles can glorify God for his mercy. There was a tendency for Jews to think of Gentiles as second class. But God's plan for them had always been in place from the beginning. Paul quoted many Old Testament verses to support this. The Jews should realize that God loved Gentiles equally and accept them with respect. After explaining this, Paul prayed again with God's hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The fact that Paul prayed twice in these verses shows us that it's not easy to accept one another. We need God's help. We must pray in order to do so. Today we've been challenged to accept one another. Accept one another. Accept one another. Especially those who are different from us. I want to give you a very short challenge based on this passage. Find a person from a different culture or a different generation whom you know very little about, who is in the body of Christ, and get to know that person. Understand that person. Share grace with that person. And grow in understanding people different from yourself. I believe the Holy Spirit will be pleased as we do this. And as we do so, may our community reflect the amazing diversity and beauty of Christ for the glory of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for giving us a clear word to accept one another as Christ accepted us. Please bless each one of us to hear this word, to put it into practice, and to grow as those who can accept others with the mind of Christ. Please bless our community that we may accept each other from our hearts, that there may be a wonderful, beautiful diversity and beauty in our community that reveals your own glory. Father, glorify your name. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen.